On this Tuesday night, if you're sick and tired of the pandemic, you're not alone. This sucks. It really, really does. COVID-19 fatigue, how plenty of Canadians are feeling it and the advice to get through it. New restrictions across Europe and Italy, rioters are fired up. While in Spain, politicians are under fire for apparent hypocrisy. Canadians who cross the border every day. So there was some, uh, you know, discrimination, I would say. One pandemic, two countries, and two very different responses. And ballots from beyond the U.S., the campaign to get Americans abroad to vote. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. It is clear there is COVID fatigue in this country and it's no wonder. We've been living with restrictions on where we can go and who we can see for almost nine months. And yet, as winter approaches, case numbers are climbing again and the number of people dying of COVID-19 in Canada is slowly creeping up too. Today, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau summed up the challenge in simple terms. We are in an unprecedented global pandemic that really sucks. This is really difficult. It's a time where we need to do the right thing. We need to lean on each other. We need to use all the tools we can. More on COVID fatigue in a moment. First, take a look at these numbers. In Ontario, more than 800 people got positive test results today. In Quebec, more than 900 new cases were reported. Manitoba set another daily record, 183. In Saskatchewan, almost 60 new cases were reported. Alberta had more than 420 today. And in BC, 217. Lots of people who get COVID-19 don't get very sick, but some people do get extremely ill and others die. And today, Canada hit a grim new milestone. The number of Canadians who have died of COVID-19 has now surpassed 10,000. In the past 24 hours, in Quebec, 19 people died. And though the number of deaths each day in Canada is much lower than it was in the spring, it's beginning to creep up. Public health experts say it could escalate quickly if the virus spreads to more elderly and more vulnerable people. Preventing that from happening requires Canadians to follow the public health rules and restrictions. It worked in the first wave, but as Mike Lecature reports, COVID fat fatigue is a big factor in what happens this winter. A foot above fitness is one of the few gyms still open in Ottawa. The owner claims that's because it's not a gym. Rather, he provides personal services by appointment, like a hair salon. He's racked up $1,900 in fines from bylaw officers, but he says it's worth taking care of his clients. Mental health, mental health, mental health. I can't say that enough. People just moving around. As your body works for you, then your brain works for you. That mental health boost comes as COVID-19 fatigue is permeating this phase of the pandemic. A new Ipsos poll for Global News finds that nearly half of Canadians say they're getting tired of following public health recommendations and rules regarding COVID-19. This sucks. It really, really does. Putting it plainly, the Prime Minister admitted we could be in for a really tough winter. Justin Trudeau said his six-year-old son even asked if COVID-19 will be around forever. With case counts rising across the country, Trudeau asked everyone to again come together by staying apart. I think we have to ask ourselves who we really are as Canadians. Are we really good neighbours? Are we really people who care about the most vulnerable, about each other? I know we are. And it doesn't mean we're going to be perfect every step of the way, and it does mean we have to continually remind ourselves to follow public health advice. But I know Canadians can get through this together. Canada's Deputy Chief Public Health Officer added it's about finding the happy medium between a full lockdown and a full reopening, which could allow COVID-19 to overwhelm the healthcare system. Dr. Howard New says it all comes down to social cohesion. Support one another is in many different ways. It could be a, you know, looking out for your, your family members, thinking what you need to do to protect uh, your elderly parents or, or your uh, loved ones who may have underlying medical conditions. Now, those messages of encouragement also came with a dose of reality. As Prime Minister Trudeau warned, Canadians have to be really careful now if they still want to have large family gatherings at Christmas. Donna, 
Okay, Mike Lecatur in Ottawa, thanks. In Manitoba, the situation is getting worse by the day. A record 183 new infections were reported there today, 144 of them in Winnipeg. 83 people are in the hospital with COVID, 15 are in intensive care, and the five-day test positivity rate is at an all-time high, 7.5%. Manitoba's premier is deeply frustrated and is pleading with people to stop ignoring the rules. People in parts of Europe are beginning to push back against newly imposed COVID-19 restrictions there. The Italian government has approved a $7 billion relief package to help sectors hardest hit by the pandemic. But there's anger about a new round of tight restrictions on what Italians are allowed to do. Protesters, some of them shouting freedom, smashed and looted shops and clashed with riot police. And in Spain, one of Europe's worst hotspots, strict new rules have been reimposed under a second state of emergency. Redmond Shannon on the reaction to Europe's powerful second wave. Broken glass in Turin as Italy breaks another record for daily cases of COVID-19. This, the result of anti-lockdown protests on Monday. Police say they fired tear gas after dodging Molotov cocktails. There were similar scenes in Milan and marches against restrictions across the country. Bars and restaurants can now only serve takeout after 6 p.m. and many regions have nighttime curfews. This woman says allowing lunch service but not dinner makes no sense. Disquiet of a different sort in Madrid, bus drivers appealing for financial help and medical staff demanding better conditions to deal with the virus. Spain also has a nationwide curfew and new restrictions to deal with the sharp second wave. If COVID spreads because people are going out, yes, it will slow it down. But I don't believe that any government actually has a solution. 150 Spanish politicians and business leaders are facing criticism after attending this gala on Monday night. We are all outraged, especially because uh, this uh, party and these photographs come basically one day after that we have been asked by our government to stay home. The Minister of Health was among those in the crowd. Una autorreflexión. A government spokesperson said all protocols were adhered to, but some self-reflection is needed. It is uh, for the entire population. It is like a slap in the face. Spain's Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez wants the current state of emergency to last up to six months. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. In the U.S., the pandemic is playing radically different roles in the presidential campaign. A week to go and President Donald Trump is playing down COVID-19 and holding big rallies in states he hopes will deliver him four more years in the White House. His rival, Joe Biden, is observing public health rules and holding smaller and fewer events. Where they go in this final week can reveal where they see their strengths and weaknesses. Jackson Prosco explains. With one week to go, Joe Biden found himself campaigning in Georgia, cautiously optimistic about a breakthrough in a state Democrats haven't won since 1992. I know this country. I know our people. And I know we can unite and heal this nation. Donald Trump returned to familiar territory in Michigan, a state he's at risk of losing after winning by just 11,000 votes in 2016. We're going to have a great red wave this time around trump faces a more complicated path to victory the states that narrowly put trump over the top in 2016 are leaning toward joe biden pennsylvania michigan and wisconsin the president is also playing defense in states he won handily iowa ohio arizona georgia north carolina and florida are no longer safe republican territory what this means is that the Democrats not only feel like uh, we have the map on our side, but there's an opportunity to extend uh, the electoral victory. In Florida, former President Barack Obama made a push to flip the state, attacking Trump's leadership. COVID, 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 he's complaining. He's jealous of COVID's media coverage. Trump remains defiantly optimistic, insisting he's got a lock on a second term. We'll take back the House. We'll hold the Senate. We'll hold the White House. In a year in which 67 million Americans have already voted, nothing seems certain. With tight races in swing states, the unknown impact of mail-in ballots, and looming court challenges over the vote.
but those things I think only come to play if this is this is sort of a repeat of 2016 and that it's that it's a, a really close race um, in, in some in some of these key states. Yet it's hard to know if it will even be close. The states in play could deliver a rapid, decisive result on election night. One week out, anything seems possible. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Back in this country, the federal Liberals hung on to two seats in Toronto in by-elections yesterday, but did suffer a significant drop in support. Former broadcaster Marcy Ian won the riding of Toronto Centre. The new Green Party leader, Anime Paul, came in a close second. Businesswoman and activist Yara Sachs held on to York Centre, but only got about 700 more votes than her Conservative challenger. The by-elections were the first electoral test of the federal government's handling of the pandemic. In Saskatchewan, the Saskatchewan party passed that test. Voters delivered an historic win in the provincial election there, delivering a fourth consecutive majority mandate for the party led by Scott Moe. It is the first time that's happened in 60 years. Global's Caitlin Wilson is following the results for us tonight. Caitlin. Donna, less than one hour after polls closed, the call was made. The Saskatchewan party winning its fourth straight majority, now the longest serving government in the country. Tonight we're celebrating a, a big honking election win. A historic night for the province with the SAS party dominating in the rural areas. Campaigning on a platform of fiscal responsibility, promising to balance the budget in the next four years and build a strong economy. Saskatchewan is poised to do uh, very, very well as the global recovery um, starts at some point in the future. And we're going to do everything that we can uh, to place Saskatchewan in a position to succeed. The party also had strong support in both Saskatoon and Regina, taking more seats than the NDP, who hoped to make advances in the major cities. Instead, it could now find itself down a leader. Ryan Miley still waiting on his fate. This is not the end. This is the beginning. But the surprise of the night, the success of the right-leaning Buffalo Party. The party describes itself as a Western Independence Party and finished second in four ridings and third in the popular vote. Signaling a frustration with the federal government, something Scott Moe acknowledged in his victory speech. We are not happy with the federal government either. And you have my word that we will continue to stand up for Saskatchewan as we have always done. But even with a Sask party win, the size of the majority won't be confirmed until later in the week after thousands of mail-in ballots are counted. Donna? Caitlin Wilson in Regina, thanks. There are more job cuts coming to Alberta's oil sector after a multi-billion dollar merger between Synovus Energy and Husky Energy. Synovus says it aims to trim its workforce by as much as 25 percent after it acquires Husky. The move could impact more than 2,000 jobs, most of them in Calgary. It's the latest blow to the Alberta oil patch. Suncor recently announced its intention to reduce staff by up to 15 percent. The man charged with shooting and killing four people in Fredericton two years ago took the stand in his own defense today. Matthew Raymond's lawyers argue he is not criminally responsible due to a mental disorder. Today, Raymond told jurors that in the lead up to the shooting, he believed everything in the news, major happenings, even traffic accidents were staged. He also testified that beginning in 2017, he thought some court cases were also fake. Raymond claims he stopped believing the conspiracy theories last year, around the time he was being treated in a forensic hospital before his trial. He's facing four counts of first-degree murder for the deaths of two police officers and two civilians. Out of control infernos coming up. What's fueling California's raging wildfires? Plus... I'm Jeff Semple in a hospital just outside Detroit, Michigan, with a tale of two border cities. I'll have that story coming up on Global National. Fire crews are trying to beat back two out-of-control wildfires burning near Los Angeles. An evacuation order is in effect for nearly 100,000 people. The powerful Santa Ana winds are fanning the flames of both the Silverado Fire and the Blue Ridge Fire. Both broke out yesterday. About 5,000 firefighters are on the front lines of fires across California in what is the worst fire season there in 18 years. 
Well, the Canada-U.S. border has been closed to non-essential travel for seven months now. Thousands of Canadians considered essential, though, still cross into the U.S. every day to work. Many of them use the Windsor-Detroit border crossing, which is normally Canada's busiest. They face challenges navigating both sides safely during the pandemic. Jeff Semple joins us from Detroit tonight. Jeff, what are you hearing? Donna, in the context of this pandemic, many Canadians have come to think of the U.S. border as our greatest protector from the perceived COVID chaos in the United States. But thousands of Canadians continue to commute across this border every single day, some at great personal risk. The Ambassador Bridge connecting Detroit with Windsor is Canada's busiest border crossing. But COVID-19 closed the door to all but an essential few. Transport trucks and others like Zane Ismail. Ever since I've lived here and grown up, it's been like a nothing to cross the border, and now there's all these stipulations. Ismail is one of around 1,600 healthcare workers who live in Windsor but work in Detroit. The city's just a couple of kilometers drive have recently seemed worlds apart. It's been really just mentally challenging just to navigate both worlds. The pandemic has been a tale of two border cities. In Windsor, they've seen fewer than 3,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19, while hospitals in Detroit have seen more than 180,000. Nobody's really sure why Detroit got hit so hard. It really was an epicenter. In some Detroit hospitals, 40% of the staff comes from Canada. Anybody who volunteered in this, I mean, every one of them is a hero. It's, it's just that simple. And as they crossed the border, those Canadians received a hero's welcome, greeted and thanked by the U.S. Consular General. The U.S. government wants to say thank you. But the reception when they returned home to Canada was chillier. So there was some, uh, you know, discrimination, I would say, right at the very, very beginning. The mayor says there were reports of cross-border workers being harassed and refused entry into some shops. There was a, a, a wide degree of fear by a lot of folks in this community. This freelance journalist had been reporting south of the border before returning home to Windsor last month. Worried about her Washington plates, she put this sign in her window. That said, I am Canadian and I have completed the 14 day quarantine because I had read stories about people with American plates across Canada having their cars damaged or being harassed just because they had U.S. plates. As Detroit's COVID-19 caseload dropped during the summer, so too did that concern about cross-border transmission. But like in Canada, cases are now climbing here again. In fact, Michigan just recently reported a record daily increase with more than 3,300 new cases. Donna? Okay, Jeff Semple in Detroit, thank you. Still ahead, a deadly blast at a school in Pakistan. Protests turned violent in Philadelphia after another police shooting of a black man and a warning, some of the video is disturbing. Over a dozen people were arrested. More than 30 officers were injured last night. Looters took advantage of the chaos, ransacking a number of businesses and setting vehicles on fire. Here's why they're angry. 27-year-old Walter Wallace was shot and killed by the police during a confrontation that was captured on video yesterday. Police claim he refused to drop his knife. A bomb blast at a religious school in northwestern Pakistan has killed a number of people and left more than 100 injured. Some of the video in this, too, is hard to watch. That's the moment of the explosion captured by amateur video. Investigators say a bag packed with five kilograms of explosives and ball bearings detonated. The cleric seen in that video appears to have survived, but at least eight other people were killed in the explosion. North Poles next, the big push to get Americans living in Canada to vote. One week until the U.S. presidential election, and there's a parallel campaign underway here in Canada. There are about 660,000 Americans living in Canada, and Democrats and Republicans are busy courting them. In the 2016 election, only 5% of them cast a ballot. There's a big push to up that number this time. Robin Gill explains why. There's no door-to-door -door campaign to hand out buttons. Instead, volunteers like Camille Mitchell, a Democrat living in Canada, 
network online channels. A lot of Americans living here don't know they can vote from here. Uh, they think they have to fly home to vote. They don't. Democrats are aggressively recruiting expats, thanks to Facebook ads and a spot on Spotify. And if you or a parent were born in the United States, you are one of them and you can vote. That campaign is aimed at Americans living in Windsor, Ontario, just across the bridge from Detroit, Michigan, a swing state. Now their opponents, Republicans overseas, admit they're not as well organized and get the strategy. In 2016, uh, Trump won by only 11,000 votes, and I would bet my last dollar there's more than 11,000 people with a right to vote in U.S. elections in the Windsor area alone. So does the expat vote matter? According to this political scientist, yes. The voting margins can be really slim because it's not the total popular vote. Hillary Clinton won the total popular vote. Al Gore won the total popular vote, but they still lost the election because they lost the vote in key swing states. Now here's where it gets interesting because the Democrats are trying to encourage dual citizens to vote. And that's where the Republicans get their backs up. To the people who just happen to have a technical claim to American citizenship in Canada and who do not identify as Americans, I, I actually don't think should be voting in American elections. But the Democrats are undeterred. They say all Americans need to show their true expatriate love. Imagine if every American overseas around the world voted, the impact that would have. It goes to show the philosophical and political divide even happens on this side of the border. Robin Gill, Global News, West Vancouver. And that is Global National for this Tuesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is a bit of a puzzle. Oh my God, I can feel it's coming. No! The Rubik's Cube, that twisty little thing that has confounded all kinds of people, has been bought by the Canadian company Spin Master. Invented nearly 50 years ago by Hungarian Erno Rubik, it is one of the world's best-selling games and has over 3 billion possible combinations. I'm still trying. Thanks for watching. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.